Okay. Um, under chapter six, <coughs> what we have to to discuss is on soils, natural vegetation, and wildlife resources of Ethiopia and the Horn. Now, when it comes to particularly the Ethiopian case, the Ethiopian soils, types, degradation, and conservation will be assessed under this chapter. Now let's begin from the definition. What is a soil? A soil is a delicate but highly varied composition of mineral particles, organic matter, and living organisms in dynamic equilibrium. Soil soil or soil consists of weathered mineral materials like 45% of organic matter, 5% of air, 20 to 30 percent and water to 20, uh, 20 to 30 percent water is to be found within the soil. Now, soil formation is a long-term process. It's not to be seen overnight. The formation of a particular type of soil depends on on the part of material that is the rock, the climate topography, living organism, and type. In here, weathering disintegrates the inorganic substances, rocks or soils. There are three types of weathering involving in soil formation. One is the mechanical or physical weathering. Physical weathering is differential stresses due to heating and cooling of or expansion of ice break the rocks for example when a rock is to be heated by sunlight during daytime there is expansion and during nighttime it contracts this expansion and contraction of the rock finally will bring in weathering of the rock abrasion or erosion by friction due to water containing sediments or wind carrying debris is another type of physical weathering. In the former case, when the outer part of the rock is to be worn out by physical weathering, the inner part will be exposed. And also when this part is worn off, the inner part will be exposed to weathering. This kind of weathering is called on a onion weathering. In the case of abrasion, when sand materials, sedimenters, are to come together, so by friction it breaks up this material and will, will change it into a soil. The second one is biological weathering is the weakening and subsequent disintegration of rock by plants, animals, and microbes. This is to say that when the root of, the root of plants goes into rock particles, they form a crack. And finally, the rock will start to break down. This kind of weathering is called biological weathering. Animals also will break rock materials and change it into soil through their hopes. The pressure is exerted by a biological process that is growing of roots. Microbial activity breaks down rock minerals by altering the rock's chemical co composition. Its composition will be altered. The third one is chemical weathering. Involves modification of the chemical and mineralogical composition of the weathered material. The most common chemical weathering processes are hydrolysis, oxidation, reduction, hydration, carbonation, and solution. These are, you know, the different types of weathering in soil formation. Soils do have two basic properties. The first one is physical property. Soil's physical properties are influenced by composition and proportion of major soil components because there are different components in the soil so these components will matter okay 
in the case of physical properties. Properties such as texture, structure, porosity, etc. are categorized under physical soil properties. Every soil will have its own structure, texture, porosity, okay, and so on and so forth. Is it porous or not? Okay, what kind of texture does it have? What kind of structure? And so on and so forth, it will be seen. These properties affect air and water movement in the soil, and thus the soil's ability to function. Some soils are not porous, whereas others are. So those porous soils will allow water and air to go through it. Whereas, on the contrary, non-porous soils or soils which lack porosity will never allow water and you know, air to pass through it. Chemical properties. Soils chemical, chem, soil chemistry is the interaction of various chemical constraints. Soil properties like availability of minerals, electrical conductivity, soil pH, etc., etc., will be seen under here. Okay? Soils do have their own pH. Hence, by considering this, oh, we now will see the major soil types of Ethiopia. One, nitosols and aquasols. Nitosols develop on gently sloping ground. They are strongly weathered soils, but far more productive than most other tropical soils. Okay? Due to the high rainfall, there is considerable soil leaching, which makes the nitosols to be poor in soluble minerals like potassium, calcium, etc., etc. The reddish brown color of these soils is because of high concentration of iron or ferric oxides due to leaching. So these soils are widely found on cultivated areas and on mountain grasslands. Nitosols are dominantly found in western highlands. The other type is aquisols. Aquisols have very low resilience to degradation and moderate sensitivity to yield decline. These are found along with nitosols mostly in some pockets of the western highlands of Ethiopia, where there is high rainfall. So whenever there is high rainfall, the soil will be leached. Due to the high rainfall, there is considerable soil leaching. Okay? Soil leaching. Okay. The other type of soil is, or the second categories, are wet soils. Verti soils are heavy clay soils with a high proportion of swelling clays when wet and the cracks and the cracks when dry. This type of soils will swell when there is high amount of rainfall, and when it's dry, this soil will start to crack. These soils are extremely difficult to manage, hence easily degraded, but has very high natural chemical fertility. In Ethiopia, they are currently found in parts of northwestern, central, and southeastern highlands. The third group are diphosols, cambisols, and rigosols. These soils are mostly found in rugged topography and steep slopes. As a result, they are young, shallow, and coarse textured. Some soils are fine textured, others are coarse textured. Lithosols are coarse textured and so have low water, water holding capacity because of their porosity. They never retain soil, I mean water. They are found in areas of low rainfall. Most of these areas, the areas covered by these soils have limited agricultural use because they are not good for agriculture. They are in most cases left under the natural plant cover and used for grazing. Since they are not productive, these soil areas with this soil type are left for grazing where animals will graze on these areas. These soils are found in different parts of rugged and steep slopes of central islands on the Rift Valley escarpments 
and the highlands of western Aragon. The eagles hole and its little souls are found in Denkel and Eastern Ogaden, so they are not good for agriculture. The fourth category is zero souls, yerbo souls, and solon chucks. These are soils of desert or dry steep soils, majorly available in arid and semi arid areas. Arid and semi arid areas are dry areas and they are not good for agriculture because they fall so limited or scattered. Desert soils are characterized by high salts, they are saline soils, and low organic content because of the scanty vegetation. Zero soils are soils of the desert and has low organic content. These soils are extremely subject to wind erosion and concentration of soluble salt. So in desert, what you can see is that there is high wind erosion. Yermo salts are even drier and more problematic than zero salts. When it comes to lunchaks, are saline soils, which develops in areas of high evaporation and capillary action. By capillary action, meaning that all the moisture will evaporate, so the soil will remain to be dry. Badly managed irrigation schemes may turn soils into swollen chucks. In Ethiopia, the aerosols are found in Ogaden and northeastern Scotland, whereas the aerosols and swollen chucks are, are covered the Ogaden in upper plains, which are not suitable for agriculture. Okay. The fifth one is fluvy soils. Fluvy soils develop on flat or nearly flat ground on recent alluvial deposits. Alluvial deposits. Alluvium is to be found in areas of low land areas, plains, because every time the soil that has been eroded from highland it will come and be deposited over these plains. These soils are associated with fluvial or river marine or sea and lacustrine or lake deposits. These are soils for the due to the deposition of eroded materials from highlands. The deposition takes place in depressions, meaning lowland areas, lower bodies and low lands. Fluvial soils are highly variable but much present for intensive agriculture because they develop on flat ground deposition area. So they are good for agriculture. They are associated with river and around water, making them important for large scale irrigation. They are fertile and their fertility is always renewable as a result of deposition on new soil materials like with the river Nile does for the Egyptians every year. The Nile River, the Abai River, will take fertile soils and deposit it in the Lower Nile Valley. In the Lower Nile Valley. Lubisols. Lubisols develop mainly in areas where pronounced wet and dry areas. Lubisols have good chemical nutrients and they are among the best agricultural soils. They are intensively cultivated because they do have good mineral content and are good for plant growth. However, when the big soils are found on steep slopes or stony and on flat areas or waterlogged, they are avoided and left for forgetting because if the soil is to be waterlogged or full of water, it won't be good for agriculture and also if it is stony, it won't be good for plant growth. So we leave it for grazing. In Ethiopia, places with lubisols include Lake Anna area, parts of northern, central, and eastern highlands, and southern lowlands. Now, the problem with soils is that what we call it soil degradation. Soil degradation is defined as a change in any or all of soil status resulting in a diminished capacity of the ecosystem to
to provide goods and services. It could also be the deterioration of the physical, chemical, and biological properties of soils. So when these properties are taken away, we call it soil degradation. It is a critical and growing global problem. What Ethiopia is facing these days is a soil degradation because of absence of planters and soils, because planters do serve as an anchor so that they won't allow the soil to be degraded. But because of desertification, soils are seen to be eroded either by water or by wind. Soil degradation undermines the productive capacity of an ecosystem. It affects global climate through alterations in water and in energy balance and disruptions in cycles of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and other elements which are good for plant growth. For plant growth. There are three major types of soil degradation. One is physical degradation. It refers to the deterioration of the physical property of soils, which includes A. Compaction is the densification of soils which is caused by the elimination or reduction of structural force. Soils prone to compactions are susceptible to accelerated runoff and erosion. They will be exposed for erosion because they are easily susceptible. B. Soil erosion is a three-phase process consisting of the detachment of individual soil particles. First, they detach. They will be transported and they will be deposited. We call this process soil erosion. The second type is biological degradation. It is reduction in soil organic matter content, decline in biomass carbon, and decreases in activity and the diversity of soil fauna are ramifications of biological degradation. Fauna refers to the plants. A third one is chemical degradation, is a nutrient deple depletion. In here, nutrient depletion is a major cause of chemical degradation. Chemical degradation is also caused by the buildup of some toxic chemical chemicals and an elemental imbalance that is injurious to plant growth. <clears throat> to plant growth. So, what are the causes for? Soil degradation. Soil degradation may result from natural and human induced causes. Topographic and climatic factors such as steep slopes, frequent floods, and tornadoes, storms, and high velocity wind, high intensity rains, and drought in dry regions are among the natural causes. So, this all will result in soil degradation. Soil degradation. Deforestation and over exploitation of vegetation, overgrazing, indiscriminate use of agrochemicals, and lack of soil conservation practices, and over extraction of groundwater are some of anthropogenic causes of soil degradation. Okay? Meaning that these are caused by humans, because it has, it's humans that do cut trees, that overexploit vegetation, okay? It is humans that do not give attention to this kind of activities. So what are the soil erosion control measures? First, the aim of soil conservation is to reduce erosion. We have two major soil erosion control mechanisms. These are, one, biological control measures. In here, these, soils of, these types of soil erosion control mechanisms include vegetative strips, okay? Strip. You plant trees and promote reforestation program. Planting of more trees will help no, 
the reduction of soil erosion. The second one, physical control measures. The major type of physical erosion control measures commonly applied in Ethiopia includes terracing, terracing, check dam, gabion, trenches, contour plowing, soil beds, and so on and so forth. Especially when it comes to terracing, we need to be smart enough, like the Konso people, who which who, that are known for their good practices on. Now, let's go to the natural vegetation of Ethiopia. Now, let's begin from the definition. What is a natural vegetation? Natural vegetation refers to a plant cover that develops with little or no human interference. When we find this plant cover, okay, naturally, Okay, with no human or little interference, we call it a natural vegetation. The characters of Ethiopia's natural vegetation are to a large extent determined by elevation or at, and temperature and also rainfall. So elevation, temperature and rainfall will determine the characters of natural vegetation in Ethiopia. The major natural vegetation types of Ethiopia includes one, the Afro-Alpine and Sub-Afro-Alpine region. Okay, Afro-Alpine and Sub-Afro-Alpine. This vegetation type, also known as high mountain vegetation, is similar to the Alpine vegetation in temperate regions. In temperate regions above 66 and a half degree north of the equator. We will see the temperate region there. These ecosystems are found on mountains having elevation ranging between 3,200 and 4,620 meters above sea level. So the alpha alpine region is found at a very high altitude from 4,000 up to 4,620 meters. 4,620 meters above sea level. So we can say that this vegetation cover is to be found in highland areas, very, very highland areas. The second is forestry. Forest is a complex ecosystem consisting predominantly of trees, predominantly of trees that shield earth and support numerous life forms. These wide variations in rainfall and altitude result in two broad classifications of forests. The highland forests, which includes Hygienia Abyssinia, or what we call it Koso, the Koso tree, Juniper, Procera orchid, Arundinaria, Alpina, or what we call it Karkaha, Polycarpus, Palicatus, Zigba, Anindaria, Adolfi, Fridensi, Araro, and Olia, Arif, Africana, Weira, and so on and so forth. Forests. While Bapia are classified as lowland forests. Moreover, there are also gallery or riverine. Moreover, there are also gallery or riverine forests. These are forests that stretch along the banks of the lower courses of rivers. So, forests that are to be found, especially in the lower course of a river, are called riverine forests. Riverine forests are classified as lowland forests and are found in some places such as the banks of Awash River, Wabisha Valley, Eganali River, etc. etc. Dominant species include Ficasso or what we call it Shola and different kinds of acacia trees. Acacia means um, grass. The third category of forests is sub woodland savanna region. Woodland savanna are Woodland savannas are 
also found in areas of wide altitude ranges from 250 to 2,300 meters. The plants in the Wundan Seven are known for their xeromorphic characteristics, like shedding of leaves during the dry season. Xeromorphic plants are plants that shed, that droop their leaves when dry, and they begin when wet. So the, this is a coping mechanism where these kind of plants will survive in desert areas. Vegeta vegetation types with intermediate characteristics between savanna and woodlands are shrub lands and bush lands. Shrubs and bushes are plants with you know very low trees and grasses. Low trees. Woodland savanna region can be broadly classified into three divisions. The first, juniper prosera, orchid, is dominant species for both the juniper forest and juniper woodlands. Second, acacia woodlands are dominated by both trees and shrubs, which belong to the same genus, acacia. The third one, mixed deciduous woodlands, deciduous, that she shed their leaves. As the name implies, most of the trees in mixed deciduous woodland shed their leaves during the dry seasons. The fourth category of forests is steppe and semi-desert regions. These are regions in the arid and semi-arid parts of the country, in desert areas. In these regions, zero phytic that is, drought-resistant plants are the dominant uh, vegetation. The romantic plants such as short shrubs, scattered cypress, of grass species, and the variety of acacias are some of the examples. Now, natural vegetation degradation. Ethiopia's forest resources have been disappearing at an alarming rate at a very, very fast rate. Major causes for the gradual disappearance of the natural vegetation in Ethiopia include one, clearing of forests for cultivation. Because of population growth, when population growth increases, there is a need to have additional land for cultivation. Hence, plants are Disappearing. Second, timber exploitation practices. Third, charcoal burning and cutting for fuel. Fourth, extension of coffee and tea production areas. Fifth, overgrazing. Sixth, expansion of settlement, both rural and urban, and clearing for cause. All these, you know, result in problem in the forest cover of Ethiopia. The forest cover of Ethiopia. So, what is, would be the natural vegetation conservation mechanism? Conservation of biodiversity is protection and management of biodiversity so as to maintain at least its current status and derive sustainable benefits for the present and future generations. We need to conserve natural vegetation in order to ensure sustainability. That is to say, the present generation should never compromise, should never use the resource of the coming generation. There are three main approaches of biodiversity conservation. First, protection. Through designation, and management of some forms of protected area. We need to protect some, uh, some area, we shouldn't conserve them. Protected areas include sanctuaries, national parks, and community conservation areas. At least we need to preserve all this. We have to protect these, especially our national parks. If we are to intervene, if we are to deforest plants in national park, parks, animals will migrate. 
to other area. So this in turn will affect the forest sector. Second, sustainable forest management. Involving sustainable harvesting of forest products to provide a source for financial income. We have to use in such a way, in a managed way. This doesn't mean that we should never cut trees. If we have to cut one, we have to plant two. By doing this, we can preserve or conserve the natural vegetation. Three, restoration or rehabilitation. This is a process of assisting the recovery of a forest ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. We need to rehabilitate it. Okay, the damaged one. We have to go for a forestation and other programs. By doing this, we can control the natural vegetation. Now let's go for wild life. Wild animals in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is, is one of the few countries in the world which possesses unique and characteristic fauna with a high level of endemicity. There are endemic animals that are to be seen only in Ethiopia. A total of 279 mammalian species, of which 31 are endemic, they are to be found only in Ethiopia, are known to occur in Ethiopia. Walia ibex, Capra wali, Gilada baboon, Mountain Yala, Ethiopia war, Stark's hair, all these are to be found only in Ethiopia. Geran species. The main wildlife concentrations in the country occur in the southern and western part of the country. Now, the wild animals in Ethiopia can be classified into five major groups. The first one is common wild animals. Those animals that are to be found in many parts of the country, example, Haina and Jakarta. The second one, game or lowland animals, which include many herbivores. Herbivores means those animals that do rely only on plants, like giraffe, wild ass, zebra, etc and carnivores are animals that rely on meat like lions, leopards and cheetah. The third one, three animals or we call them arboreals. Arboreals are three animals which include like monkeys and baboons. The fourth one, a variety of birds in the Rift Valley lakes. And the fifth one, rare animals like Chilada Babu. Semenmo fox, scattered in, are, are scattered in the highlands. Walea ibex in the Semen Massif, Niala in the Arisibari Massif. These are, you know, the groups of animals in Ethiopia. Wildlife conservation. The importance of wildlife can be categorized as ecological importance, economic importance, investigative, investigatory importance, conservation of biological diversities, and so on and so forth. Wild animals can be used for, one, scientific and educational researches, valuable information for medical purposes and environmental studies. Two, physical and mental recreation, aesthetic value. Tourists will come to Ethiopia to see Mount Miala or Chulada Baboon or Walea Apex. Three, promotion of tourism, its economic value, its potential for domestication, maintaining ecological balance, they maintain the ecological balance. To prevent the destruction of wildlife, wildlife reserves, etc., etc., et have been established in different parts of the country. And in Ethiopia, there are 21 major natural parks. And you can see this on your module under table 6. Two, major wildlife sanctuaries. Three, wild reserves. And six, community conservation areas. All these are constructed 
you know, to protect wild animals from danger. Two wildlife res rescue centers, 22 controlled hunting areas, two botanical gardens, and three biosphere reserves. Some of the national parks are unique in their wild animals. They have, example, one Abiyata Shalamex National Park is predominantly bird sanctuary, where you can see a variety of birds in the Abiyata Shala Lake. Two, Omomago and Gambella National Park have hippopotamus and crocodiles in rivers and lakes. Three, Semen and Bari Mountain National Parks have rare animals like Wally Ibex, Semen Fox, Tila the Baboon, and that of Niala. So what are the challenges of wildlife conservation in Ethiopia? Here are some of the major challenges that Ethiopia protected areas are facing. One, limited awareness on the importance of wildlife. The community do have limited awareness on wildlife conservation. Two, expansion of human settlements in protected areas. Three, conflict over resource, especially conflict over grazing land by the lowlanders. Four, overgrazing for fodder and food. Five, illegal wildlife trade. Six, excessive hunting. Seven, tourism and recreational treasure. Eight, mining and construction material extraction and nine forest fire. All these are the challenges related with that of wildlife conservation. 